Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so very thankful for your word, for the opportunity that you've given us to just feast on your word together, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. God, just ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study, we had covered several verses, but I would like to do somewhat of a review of where we've come so far in this study. Uh, the subject matter is the gospel. If you listen to my last video, you know where we stand as far as the gospel is concerned. And 1 Corinthians 15 is the primary passage in all of the New Testament concerning the gospel. And I don't see how that we could talk about anything as important as that. Now I'd like to, in this short review, I would like to at least maybe clear up a little bit of the fog. I've had some people uh, write me and tell me they didn't quite understand where I was coming from uh, as it concerned this passage here in chapter 15. And so I'd like to try to simplify it if I could and by going down through the verses and just basically commenting on these verses from the heart as I read them, as I understand them, uh, and trying to, to understand what the Holy Spirit was trying to convey when he wrote these words through Paul, which was a letter to the church at Corinth, uh, but which most likely was shared with other churches, which eventually became part of the official canon. It became part of the Word of God. So I remind you again that we're not looking at Paul's reasoning or logic or his thoughts, but we're looking at what the Holy Spirit wanted Paul to write. And what's extremely important is context, folks. I've preached on this, I don't know how much, uh, apart from context, we don't really have a way to understand the meaning that the Holy Spirit intended to convey. Context is very important in any writing that we do. If we write a letter to someone else and we address it to them, then it, it does make a difference if someone else other than the person we wrote it to is reading it. Uh, all Scripture is for us, but not all Scripture is to us. And what's remarkable about this passage, which is looked at as primarily as one of the primary passages on evangelism, on getting people saved, there's nothing in the context like that at all. Now that may surprise many people, but it shouldn't, because right from the very beginning we're looking at at some clear indicators that God is writing to His people and He calls them brethren. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. This, there's not another. This is, this, is it. this is it. Which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. And I pointed out that's a that is a perfect tense. They, they received it. Uh, the perfect tense declares that something occurred, a, an action in the past occurred, which uh, uh, is not to be repeated. But more than that, it was something that occurred in the past with, which is not going to be repeated again in the future. These people received the Word of God. They received what Paul had preached unto them. And, they, and wherein you stand, they stand in it. That's another perfect tense. So we're looking at 
let, let me just try to put it this way. If I had been a first century Jewish Christian hearing this letter read in a synagogue in Corinth, I'm sitting I, I, in the pews or I guess maybe a marble bench or whatever. But I'm sitting in the congregation and I hear this letter preached. The first thing that I'm going to notice is that the letter is addressed to me, the church. And I'm, and I'm going to understand that what, what this person is reading up here, whether it's, it's Paul or, or whoever it is there at the church at Corinth, or if I'm reading the letter myself, the first thing I'm going to understand is that God, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, is speaking to me and He's calling me a brother. He's saying that I have received this gospel and that I stand in this gospel. And in verse 2, this is where everybody, it throws everybody off. Because in verse 2 it says, By which also ye are saved. And we make that word saved redemption. When it's not, it's deliverance. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, So I, it depends on how you read this. If, if you were an Arminian, you would read this to say that the gospel, the word saved there, by which you are also saved, that's, the, that's redemption, that's being born again. And the only way that you're going to be born again or stay born again is if you don't believe that gospel in vain. Uh, I am afraid that I am not doing a very good job with what was what I consider, personally consider, and I'm sure many others do, the most important passage concerning the gospel in all of the New Testament. There's so much here, folks, that we need to slow down and understand as we go forward if any of this is going to make any sense. I pointed out repeatedly that we as believers in Christ are redeemed by nothing that we did. We're born again from above by God, not, not the will of the flesh, but of the will of God. We, had no, we played no part in, our, in, in that process of redemption. God redeemed us wholly, completely apart from anything that we did. And He did so, so that we would be saved, so that we'd be saved. We are redeemed in order to be saved, and that is exactly how the passage here, these verses come together, and this is exactly what it's talking about. He calls them brethren. They did receive the gospel. They do stand in the gospel, okay? That's, that's what they receive, that's what they stand in. They are God's people, but not all God's people actually believe. And what does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? Folks, if you stick with the context, then what we find out in verse, starting beginning at verse 3, when we start reading the gospel, what we see is, is that to receive God's grace in vain would be not to believe that He died for our sins, not to believe that He was buried, not to believe that He rose again from the dead. And as strange as you may think that sounds, believe me, there are many, many, many Christians today, and there always has, have been many Christians, many children of God who, who do not believe that Christ paid for their sins. They hope that He paid for their sins. They, they pray that God has forgiven them of all their sins. They're not sure if God has forgiven them of all their sins. Uh, in fact, many are, were, are not sure that Christ rose from the dead. If, it's, if you think it's 
if you find it difficult to believe that there's, there are Christians today as there were in years past that are born again children of God who don't believe that Christ was died, was buried, and raised again from the dead, And I know that that sounds very difficult to wrap your mind around, but folks, that's how we were before we came into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We didn't believe any of that. And yet, we were God's child, born again from above. God redeemed us. Our sins were paid for when Christ died. We, we are the elect children of God, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And at one time, we did not believe anything, basically. The, what's remarkable about this passage, folks, is it is not calling upon man to do anything to be redeemed. Nowhere in the passage is there even the slightest hint of, of some non-believer that needs redeemed being invited to come to the Lord to believe that he, that he died, was buried, and raised again from the dead so that he'll be redeemed. It's talking to God's people who are redeemed, who need delivered, who need saved. And to believe in vain is not, is not something some scary sentence, some scary passage there that now all of a sudden we're talking, the Holy Spirit reverts back to someone who's not redeemed. They have believed God in vain. They're going to hell because they're not redeemed. We cannot do that with the text, dearly beloved. We can't. We're not allowed to do that, to handle God's Word that way. He is addressing the redeemed. And the re it is the redeemed that can believe in vain, not the non-redeemed. That's the first point that I want to make clear here. For, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the, the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas. That's the Aramaic name for Peter. We know that's Peter. Then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep put to sleep. That's a passive voice. They didn't make themselves go to sleep. And, and dearly beloved, they certainly didn't die. You know, uh, I know it may sound a little goofy to, for me to say that as Christians, the word death or die, or I'm going to die, I may die, or this person, this brother of mine died, is really not strictly speaking uh, the correct language to use. God says we'll never die. Christ became incarnate. God Almighty in human flesh, He took upon me my sin. He was made sin for me in order that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. There's no judgment for those who are in Christ. I cannot die uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with the. It's a, it's a shadow of death. We don't, we don't experience death in the sense that the Bible typically. Now our body dies, yes, but we are put to sleep by God, and that is that is. There's great comfort in those words. That when our to know that when our time is up here, that God put us asleep. We didn't die. No one killed us. God didn't just kill us, but He put us to sleep. 
And of course that, that raises a whole lot of other questions. We can get into a whole lot of other discussions on it, what it means to be asleep, you know, whether there's disembodied spirits in heaven and so on and so forth. And, and uh, that's not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to really clarify the 15th chapter, which pertains to the gospel, to bring a lot of clarity to that, to that, to your understanding of, of what the thought that, that is in the mind of the Holy Spirit as he, as he wrote this to God's people whom he redeemed, whom Christ redeemed, they were his people and now the concern on the part of God, the Holy Spirit, is that His people be delivered, saved. And the clear indication is that they may not be. Uh, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that a person can be born again, he can be heaven bound, and never, never believe God. What does it mean to believe God? unless we believed in vain. We're not trusting God. We're not trusting God that what He said is true. And I believe in, in the general overall sense that that, belief, that vain belief can cover any area, every area of, of doctrine, faith in our lives. But the context, folks, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And in the first century, these early Jewish Christians Many of them were struggling with that, that fact, those facts, in, in believing God that, that God had raised him from the dead. Uh, you'd be astounded, maybe, uh, I am, at the number of churches today who actually don't believe that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. No one ever really ro rose from the dead. That's many b Christians actually hold to that belief. You may find that difficult to believe, but it's true. Verse seven, after that he was uh, seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last, verse eight, last of all he was seen of me also. He's referring to his conversion on the road to Damascus as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. Uh, and am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You know, if I ever ran into a believer who formerly persecuted the church of God before he became came to realize that he was a believer in Christ, I am fairly positive that that person would look back on the time in which he persecuted the church of God and he would think that he was not, he surely he could not have been a Christian at that time. When what he needs to realize is that he always was. And we, again, we are forced with having to, we are being brought to face to face with the reality that we're forced to accept, and that is that many of God's people, uh, were, they were always God's people, even though they didn't know that they were God's people. And again, that, that fits right into the whole context of our being redeemed and yet not believing and believing in vain. I think that's... Uh, fairly well explains what his words, what he's saying when he says, as of one born out of due time. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles. The, the least of the apostles. Not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And folks, you could, I could stop here, right here, and build a campfire, stay here about a week, and I could preach to you for a week on those words. We are only what we are by the grace of God. 
you're making an enormous mistake by thinking that you are what you are because of what you've done. God's grace is effective. It's never ineffective. God doesn't uh, give grace and it not accomplish the purpose for which it was intended. Yes, we can receive and believe the gospel in vain. We can not be trusting God that what He said is true of us while we're be, while we are His child, I mean we're 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 God's child, born from above, redeemed. Our sins are fully paid for. And I don't know how many Christians I've met who's they struggle with the fact of believing God whether their sins were really covered or paid for, that God really forgave them all. You know, it's the whole idea is, you know, well, you know, I, I, I uh, yeah, I'm believing God on Monday, but then I'm doubting Him on Tuesday. And well, of course, if I die on Tuesday, well, then I go to hell because I believed in vain. Folks, you can't do that. Okay, it's God the one, God said He's the one that puts us to sleep. So He decides to put you to sleep on a, on a Tuesday. You're believing God on Monday. You're not believing Him on Tuesday. He decides to, to put you to sleep on a Tuesday and you're going to go to hell. Folks, you can't do that. Not with the Word of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His, gr His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Paul is saying that it's, he's not saying, well, but His grace, but the grace of God, which was bestowed upon me, was, was not in vain, where that I didn't believe God, and I wasn't a child of God, and I wasn't really redeemed, I wasn't really born again, and so, you know, I'm headed for hell. Now what he's saying is, is he's saying that I labored. He say he's saying that the grace of God. It's by the grace of God I am what I am. I had no no part in that at all. But I but I labored more abundantly than they all. Uh, his grace upon me was not in vain. I actually trusted God, believed God. We're looking at a, at, a, at a Paul, an Apostle Paul, who's redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and he's, the Holy Spirit is confirming the fact that Paul himself did not receive the grace of God in, in vain, but that he, uh, he, he trusted that what God said was true, and he's, he labored more abundantly than everyone else. At least, that's what the Holy Spirit says of Paul. And what's amazing about this to me is, is that uh, so that we don't decide to slip our own thought into that and say, well, uh, yeah, that's, you know, and just give Paul all the praise for, for laboring so heavily. The Holy Spirit sort of nips that in the bud and says, no, I can't do that uh, because... Uh, Yet not I, he says, but the grace of God which was with me. Verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. You know, and once again, I, I remind you, you know, of, and I've, I've mentioned this several times, how that we preach to the air. We preach to the room. We don't preach to some individual. We don't preach regarding their sins. We see someone involved in some sinful, some horrible activity, and so, well, that'll make a good sermon. So we, you know, the following Sunday we preach on that, and we, we preach law, not grace. And you know, we're we're using him sort of as an escape, as a scapegoat here. We're using him as an example on on how not what not to do and how not to live, and 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 all of that. And that's not has nothing to do with the grace of God at all. You know, uh, when Paul says, I labored more abundantly than, than they all, yet not, yet not I, not I, but the grace of God. That, that phrase, yet not I, reminds me of Galatians 
It's not I, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself for me. I do not make of no effect the grace of God, for if Christ died, for if, if uh, I don't make, I don't nullify the grace of God, for if any righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. There's our word again. And of course, in this passage, I think we see the word vain appear four times. So I, anytime we see that word appear so often, I think we should take notice. Anytime we see any word, the Holy Spirit repeat himself in any way, shape, form, or fashion, I think we ought to take notice because the Holy Spirit is putting a lot of emphasis on those words. Verse 11, therefore, whether it were I or they, doesn't matter who's, who's doing the preaching, so we preach and so ye believed. The text is saying that they believed. Verse 12, now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, which is what Paul was doing, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? We, again, we have a confirmation that God's people, which is really odd because we don't typically look at, think of God's people as those who would believe that Christ didn't raise from the dead. You know, that just doesn't make sense to us. Generally speaking, it doesn't seem to make a lick of sense. And here we have the Holy Spirit confirming that in the early church, and I'm, I believe this is the immediate context, but here we are in 2022, uh, getting ready to go into 2023, and I don't think much has ch ever changed. Nothing new under the sun. We still have believers today who do not believe, uh, and I use the, the, that be word believer loosely, it's, as, it's a term of endearment, but I should say children of God, those who are redeemed, who don't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I, there was a time where I fit that description perfectly, and so did you. Because the important thing to understand is that you always were a child of God even, even before you came to believe. Believing doesn't make us redeemed, folks. Okay? Uh, there are many Christians today who don't believe they are, they have been redeemed. They don't believe that they're children of God. They're not sure of it. They struggle with that concept of eternal security. And the reason why they do is because they're looking for some validation, some confirmation in themselves to, to confirm or validate the fact that they have truly been redeemed. You know, and, and, and you know, you can flounder, you can uh, uh, back, you can uh, sort of bounce back and forth one day to the next from, you know, believing, you know, one day you believe that, you know, you, you're saved and the next day you don't and, and you use the word saved in the sense of redemption. You don't really understand that the, primarily the word saved means delivered, rescued. doesn't mean redeemed. And I don't know why churches today just won't stand up and say to their congregations, it wouldn't be very difficult to do. Why is it when you walk into churches today in churches all across the land, from coast to coast, from one end of the earth to the other, from, the, from as far as the east is from the west, and the north is from the south, why are Christian churches today not eagerly, excitedly, enthusiastically telling their congregations as soon as they walk through the door that they were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world? I can't explain that except that the doctrine of election just goes against the whole entire concept of modern day evangelism and 
What's really remarkable about the passage that we're looking at is that it is not evangelistic by nature at all. It's addressed to God's people and it's describing uh, the gospel in a way which doesn't, is not laying out any prerequisites, any, any conditions, any qualifying conditions that people have to do in order to become redeemed. Notice, first of all, that what, you know, going back to verse 3, it, it, what it does not say. Okay, it doesn't say, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also, uh, also received, that you needed to accept Christ in, you, in your life and, and be redeemed, become redeemed. There is, this is not of an evangelistic passage at all. Now what it is, it's more of a God declaring what is true of His people rather than uh, some invite to those who are not His to where the, you know, goats somehow become sheep. Verse 14 clearly states that, and if Christ be not ris risen, then is our preaching vain. Our preaching is vain if He's not risen. So we see in the word vain, it's uh, of, no, of no purpose. There's, well, there's no purpose to our preaching if Christ hasn't been raised. Uh, we can be a child of God, and if we're not trusting God that what He said is true of us as His children, then the same thing is true. We're, we're, we believed in vain. We believed to no purpose. God is clearly concerned here in... In this passage, what I see is God's heart for His people, for His sheep, not goats to become sheep. That's not the concern at all here. That alone is amazing in and of itself, uh, or, or it should be to many Christians. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Makes sense. Verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Huh? You know, when you just follow the simple logic through this, the, the baby step your way through this, it all ties together. It all makes perfect sense. Uh, uh, if we, if we testify of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, you know, if 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 that's our testimony in Christ, and God didn't really raise up Christ, then both our preaching and our faith is in vain. That's 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 what it's saying, but it's talking to believers. It's not talking to non-believers. It's not. There's nowhere, nowhere here is a is is the unredeemed being addressed. Nowhere here is there any message to a goat. Or is there any message to uh, to tear? Okay, we are the elect. We are the children of God. We, when we started out in this chapter, it's moreover, brethren. You've got to underline the brethren, folks. You got to nail that down hard. The context is who he's speaking to, not whom he'd like to be to be speaking to. Okay, like you know, the context is not those who are not his. In fact, you know, and I've said this many times before, the Word of God really doesn't have anything to say to the non-believer except for judgment. You know, you, you might kind of look at our being redeemed and not saved and not trusting God that what He said is true in our lives, that He's forgiven all our sins, that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, that we're, uh, heaven is assured, and we could just go on and on and on with that. You, you could look at that as as, well, you know, we're children of God, but we're not trusting Him, therefore we're sort of in this dry creek bed here with, without much water. You know, I mean, it's, you know, our... Uh, but if, if what was true, God is say, says is true of us, if that was not true, then our preaching and everything, our faith would be in vain, but the fact that it is true, guess what? Our preaching and our faith is not in vain. What the verse is not saying, it is not saying by which you are redeemed unless you believed in vain. It's by which you are saved 
unless you have believed in vain. So we're going to stop right here until next time. I trust that you're all well. Rest in Him, dearly beloved. Believe God concerning what He said is true of you, and you will be saved. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. You know, just because Choctaw here doesn't believe he's a horse does not mean he's not a horse. Of course, I really don't know what he believes.